I beat the music out here. That's how fired up I am to be here with you today. Hasn't this been a wonderful event so far? I think so. Okay, so I want to share with you guys something that happened to me about two years ago. And how many of you in, in the course of your job or in the course of being in graduate school, you found yourself up late working? Anyone? <laughs> yes, all of you. Well, I was doing this one night. I was in my home office. And in my home office, I set up to work on a presentation kind of like the one I'm going to share with you today. And I had some things there with me. I had my laptop. I had a nice 32 ounce container of water, and I had piles upon piles of papers all over my desk. Because you see, well-intentioned marketers, much like the people I work with, much like you, find it fun to send me all sorts of mail I really don't want. And because I'm inherently lazy, it all piles up on my home office desk. But then late at night, when I should be working on something, this thing called procrastination kicks in, and I decide it's time to shred all of these papers. So here I am, imagine me, I'm there with my paper shredder. And how many pages did my shredder get through before it jammed? Anyone? Two, you're exactly right, it was two. <laughs> two pages. So now I am kind of like this. I'm up under my desk trying to unjam the paper shredder. Now what's on my desk? Water, laptop, right? So what happens when I lean up as I'm trying to pull the sheet of paper out? The water pours right into the of my MacBook Pro. Hmm. You guys are feeling it, aren't you? It, 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 my, t my chest gets tight every time I show that slide. Well, I leap into action. I'm pulling the power wire out of my laptop. I'm holding the, holding the power button with my, with my finger as I'm shaking the laptop upside down, trying to get as much of the water out as possible. Who's been here before? Anyone? And at this point, you would know that I've now done everything I can do. It's now a waiting game. <laughs> but then I have an idea. You see, it was about 9 or actually 8.50 or so, 8.45 or so on a Thursday evening. I live 10 minutes from my local mall, which has an Apple store. So I rush out to my car. I hop in my car. I sit my laptop in the passenger seat. I buckle it in, as you would do rush into the store, and I knew that the next person I spoke to was going to control my fate, right? And so as soon as I walk through the Apple Store door, I run into someone like this. And I knew he worked for the Apple Store because he was wearing the t-shirt and his jeans were too tight. <laughs> and so I walked over to him, I put the biggest smile on my face and said, I've just spilled water on my laptop. I'd like to talk to someone. And he looked back at me, he smiled, as I'm sure he was trained to do, and said, oh, I'm sorry, sir, but we're about to close, and there are no more appointments available today. I said, no, 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 you don't understand. I don't need an appointment. I need to see someone. Not computing the difference between those two statements, he calls a manager over. Now imagine me standing there with this guy and a manager, both of them explaining to me all of the reasons they cannot help me. And so as I got to thinking about this, I, was, I realized I was really frustrated in this moment. And I probably wasn't being very rational in the moment, but I just wanted someone to say, hey, this is going to be OK. And a few seconds later, one of the Mac geniuses walks over. And I knew he was the Mac genius because his t-shirt was of a different color. That's how you tell him apart. <laughs> and he looks at me dead in the eye, kind of like a hero does in a Western movie, and he said, I hear we have a water problem. <laughs> <laughs> and proceeds to tell me that what they could do is they could just take a look inside and see how bad the damage might be and told me what a repair would look like. And at that moment, at that moment I realized something. The first two people I spoke to, they were there to follow the process, to do exactly what they were supposed to do. But then the third guy, the third guy said, you know what, here's a guy I can help. Here's a guy that I can do something for, so I'm going to choose to do that. And that's the question we face in business today. Do we go with the high-tech solution, 
or do we go with the high touch solution? And in some ways, when we go with that high tech solution, the humanity kind of falls out of business. But I believe there is a better way. So to quote a famous author, high tech or high touch? That is the question. <laughs> and I know Shakespeare once said this because I read it on the internet. <laughs> but in all seriousness, let me show you a company who gets this better way. And we're gonna take a look at a company called Westpac. Now Westpac is the third largest bank in Australia and New Zealand. They have nearly $250 million in transactions that run through their systems every month. I said 250, the slide says 100, let's go with what the slide says, 100 million in transactions every month. I inflated their numbers a bit. Or maybe I converted to US dollars in my head, you'll never know. And they realized that using this data, they could predict what products a customer might need next, okay? And so what they were able to see, they were able to see the customer's journey, see how their lives changed over time. And they were able to then take that data and organize their, their customers into clusters and say, you know, Evan is a lot like this other group of customers we have. And the other group of customers, they tend to get this account next, so maybe Evan needs that next. And so they decided to implement what was called the Know Me program. And with the Know Me program, they determined for every single one of their customers what they call a next best offer. That is, what is the thing that we're going to offer to this customer next? Now, as a marketer, once we've used our data to determine these next best offers, what do we then, how would we then communicate that to our customers? What would you guys do? Anyone, shout it out. Send an email, that's a good idea, what else? Retarget them on social, great idea, what else? Send them a coupon, absolutely. You know what they did? They did none of those things. Oops. <laughs> Instead, every single person in their call center in the software that they use, or every single teller that you spoke to in person, they displayed the next best offer in front of them. And then they would say to the customer, after they were done taking care of their business, they would say, you know, we were looking at your account history, and we believe that this may be a good product for you. So let's say they didn't take that approach. Let's say they went down the path of deciding that they wanted to, let's say they were down the path that they wanted to do the email or the, or the retargeting on social, what would a good conversion percentage be for them, anyone? 2%. 2% is a fantastic conversion number. You're getting bonuses and promotions with a 2% conversion number. So what do we think their performance was? With the in-person approach, what, what do you think they, their version was? Okay, I heard lots of numbers there. So I'm gonna tell you, it was north of 40%. 40%. So let's talk about that 2% though for a moment, the 2%. What about the other 98%? Friends, I like to call them the annoyed majority. <laughs> because they're the people we had to irritate relentlessly to get that 2% conversion. But here, by taking a different approach, the same day to the same offer, we're converting north of 40%. And I believe that's because we put the human touch into the marketing. And so when I work with companies, I believe that they should strive for an experience that does three things. It creates a better experience for the customer, a better experience for their employees, and a better experience for the bottom line. I call that the win-win-win. So friends, we're gonna practice that today. When I say win-win, what do you say? Win. Exactly, so I call that the win-win. Perfect. Okay, so let's analyze Westpac. If we're convert converting the 40% here, converting north of 40%, is this a better experience for the customer? Do you think the customer is appreciating it? I think it is. Now, let's talk about the employees. 
These are customer service employees. They're not sales employees. Do you think they feel like they're helping the customer instead of selling to the customer? I think so. So it's a win for them. Now what about the bottom line? Well, it turns out, yes, absolutely it is. It turns out in the first year, in the first year, they, this 40% that they converted resulted in 22 million in additional revenue for the bank. Now, now um, those of you who are majoring in accounting, we don't have any accounting folks in the room, do we? Or is Mike still in the room? <laughs> he would want me to point out to you that revenue is money the bank gets to keep. This is the money they operate on, not deposit. So it's not your money that they're holding, this is the money that they made off of your money that they're holding, 22 million. So does this meet the model of being a win-win-win? Yes. yes, I think so. And so I look at this as the opportunity that we all have as marketers to think differently about the way we go about our marketing, to look for ways that we can be more human in our marketing instead of less human. And so there's a framework I want to share with you. Actually, it's a bit of data that comes from IBM research, but let me share my personal mantra first. And that is, let technology do what technology does best so that people can then do what people do best. As if I just called upon the gods of technology and they let me down before our very eyes. Let people do what people do best. And we'll go into the, the IBM research that backs this up now, but in my belief, we shouldn't be looking at using technology to replace the human touch. We should be putting technology behind people and helping people, helping our customer service um, employees, helping ourselves to be more human in our approach. So now to that wonderful IBM research. <laughs> there we go, IBM. Okay, the first piece from this research is that 76% of those studies expect or studied expect organizations to understand their individual needs. And in my mind, that is what is the relationship that we have with the customer? Another piece from this very same study is that 81% of consumers studied said that they demand improved response time. So the question is, how can we be more responsive to our customers? And third, and this is my very favorite, and that is that 68% said they anticipate that organizations will harmonize the customer experience. Anyone here a musician? Sir, what does it mean to harmonize? Stack multiple voices together. And when done well, what does it sound like? <laughs> yes. So now for those of us that are less musically inclined, who was that over there? She, she's hiding herself. Let's, let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> so friends, for the less musically inclined, how did that sound to us, good or bad? Good, right. So does it take a lot of practice in music to sound good? Nope, okay, well, not for her, but for most of us, yes. What is the opposite of harmony? Anyone know the word? Chaos. Chaos is a good word. Discord is the musical term for it, discord. And if you don't know what discord sounds like, discord sounds a little bit like a, like a fifth grade band concert if you've ever been to one. You're not certain that everyone there is on the same sheet of music. <laughs> and oftentimes in our organizations, that's what it feels like, that everyone's not on the same page, not playing the same sheet of music in harmony. And it takes work to get to that point. So our third point is readiness, the training that we have to do to get to that point. So re relationship responsiveness and readiness, the title of my presentation, now, this is a framework that comes from my most recent book, and let me ask you guys, you guys are marketers, what, what do I call this framework? Here's a hint. The three R's, imagine that. <laughs> imagine that. So, relationship responsiveness and readiness, and we're gonna dig into each of them in our time here today. So we'll start with relationship. 
And for relationship, I want to take you guys on a bit of a trip. And this trip involves this guy, his name is uh, Doug Logue. Doug Logue actually resi resides here uh, in Florida, and he was in Toronto for a bachelor party weekend. Now, the entire time that Doug was gone, he kind of had this strange feeling that he was forgetting something. You guys ever have this feeling like you're forgetting something? Yeah. Well, here's what it was for Doug. He had a big aha moment, and it turns out that he had forgotten that the day he returns home from Toronto just so happened to be his wife's birthday. Oh, no, no, yes, I heard that over there, yes. The finger goes in the air. And he realized that the only thing worse than missing your wife's birthday was, in fact, trying to make up for it the next day. So Doug's in a panic. No worries. He goes to the lobby computer in his hotel. He goes to the Tory Burch website. He orders her a nice pair of shoes. He goes on about the activities of the bachelor party weekend. And later, he realized that the shipping option wasn't correct and that the shoes would not arrive until the day after his wife's birthday. So he panicked a bit, but no worries. He flew back in in time so that he could get to a Tory Burch store. He walks into a Tory Burch store, and this is where he meets Michelle, Michelle the sales associate. And he tries at this point to, um, to tell Michelle everything that's happened, and he was just pouring out his entire story of how just problematic this was, and she said, stop, don't worry about it. I see here that you ordered this pair of shoes, you ordered a seven, we have that in stock. I'll just go get a pair for you, We'll ring them up when the other pair comes in, bring it back, we'll do a full refund, no problem. So at this point, Doug's you know, feeling better about things, he's in the store. What happens next? He was just in Toronto, so when he pulls out his credit card, what happens? It's declined because he forgot to call the 800 number on the bat that you're supposed to call when you say that you're going to be out of, out of the country. So Doug is uh, panicking a bit. At this point, Michelle says, you know what, Doug? How about you enjoy this ice cold Corona while you wait? And while you're on the phone, just enjoy that and, um, you know, we'll get this sorted out. She calms Doug down, right? He goes off and um, away once they sort everything out. His wife loves the shoes. They come back a couple of days later. Once they're back a couple of days later, Michelle greets Doug again, gives him an iPad to use while he's in the store to, to entertain himself, gives him another Corona. He's, he's in the back of the store chilling. He's happy. And his wife is browsing. And a little bit later, they leave. Sounds like an ordinary shopping trip. Two days later, Doug hears from Michelle. Phone call. Hey, Doug, this is Michelle from Tory Burch. By the way, your wife was looking at this particular item while she was in the store. I was curious if you wanted to get that for her as another gift. Um, I'd be happy to go ahead and put it aside for you. At this point, Doug said, you know what? I, I think I'm, I'm done with gifting for right now, so he declined. Two weeks later, an email comes in from Michelle. Doug, this is Michelle at Tory Burch again. And Remember the item that your wife was looking at? It turns out that we're doing a special. And remembering that Doug tends to forget holidays, she said, would you like for me to put one away for the Christmas holiday for you? And at this point, Doug said, yes, absolutely, please do that. And the reason I know this story is because Doug couldn't understand this. He thought he was just a guy that had a problem. And then he has all this attention his way from Tory Burch. And so as it turns out, he realized after talking to them that they have an app that they use to keep up with every single customer interaction, both in person and in the store. And it's called Client Book. And if this, this clicker would decide to uh, work for me here, there we go. It's Client Book. They keep up with all of the interactions there. Now, turns out that those customers who have a client book profile, they tend to have an average order value that is 68. 62. See, I'm getting the numbers all messed up without the prompt. Back up. 62% higher than other customers. Let's, let's ask the question. If orders tend to be 62% higher, does 
that mean this is better for the bottom line? Yes, I think so. Do you think Michelle feels empowered to give great customer service because she has this data at her disposal? Yes, I think so. Do you think that the customers enjoy this experience? They feel like they're people instead of just a number. Does that meet our criteria? That is a win-win. Thank you. All right, so we're going to move now to our second R. And this one's a bit different. This one we're going to go to South Africa for. This is, this is, uh, this is Santam Insurance. They're based in, in South Africa. And they had a problem with fraud. They had a problem with fraudulent claims. But yet their, their customers were telling them, their customers were telling them that they were not paying claims quickly enough. Now, friends, I know we're not majoring in you know, insurance-related fields here. But if you have a problem with fraud, you need to do what when a claim comes in? You need to analyze it. You need to scrutinize it, right? And what does that take? Time. But wait a minute. My customers said they want me to pay claims more quickly. How do we navigate that divide? Well, it turns out the folks at Santam decided to bring in uh, IBM, and they brought in a solution that allowed them to automatically categorize each claim as it came in. It divided the high-risk ones from the extremely low-risk ones. In fact, the lowest-risk claims, they determined that it would be more expensive to analyze them than it would be to pay them. What did they do? They paid them. Guys, is it just me or is my microphone cutting out? Can I, can I get something that that from happening, a handheld or something? I'm happy to hold it, but I just want something that works. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah. It's, like the, it's like the technology guy shows up and all the technology stops working. It's funny how that works. So they paid those claims immediately. Other claims they dispatched to a special team, and that special team then chose to, um, to scrutinize those further. The net result is that by virtue of having the technology in place, they were then able to pay claims quickly. And so here's how it turned out. They were able to reduce their processing time by 90%. So what that means is if it used to take 10 days to pay a claim, it now took one day. Now, in the first year alone with this program, so assuming they paid less than $2.5 million for this particular software, was that better for the bottom line? So what did we do here? Did we make the customer happier? Do you think the employees feel like they spend their time on work that matters instead of work that they're just processing through? I think so. And assuming that the numbers check out, that's a lot of money that the bottom line saved. So that would be a win-win. Exactly. All right, now we're going to move to the third R, which is readiness. And for readiness, since we are here in Florida, we are going to visit, my friends, the happiest place on earth. Now, a lot of speakers will, will talk to you about the Disney experience, and I'm not going to share that with you today. But what I am going to share is something you might not know, that deep below the Cinderella Castle here is something called the Disney Operational Command Center. And here is where they can monitor everything that's going on inside of the park. So for instance, they can tell you if rides are meeting their ridership goals. They can tell you how long the wait times are at certain rides. And I learned about all of this via a New York Times article. And the guy with his back to you, he's a New York Times reporter. And the guy in the salmon, he happens to have the greatest job title on this planet. His title at the time this was taken was Vice President of the Magic Kingdom. <laughs> Believe me, I have a Google alert set up for if that job becomes available. <laughs> That's a good job. But all joking aside, and that, that really is his job title, but all fun aside, in the Operational Command Center, they can determine things like which parts of the park are more full than others. Such that, let's say that Adventureland is getting kind of full, and Tomorrowland is a little more open, they have an on-demand parade they can dispatch that will jam up certain entrances and alleyways and open up others such that you thought it was your idea to go somewhere else instead. 
But not stopping there, not stopping there, they decided to implement uh, this piece of technology called the Magic Band. Yes, we're familiar with that. And the Magic Band replaces pretty much everything you see here. It replaces your park ticket, it replaces you know, cash, you can use it to pay for things, it replaces your photo pass, it replaces your, your fast pass, all of these things. And I tested it myself a few months ago, and I can tell you for a fact it works better than the analog alternative. <laughs> yes. Well, and, and you know, speaking of, but speaking of the analog alternative, with the technology in place, they have been able to accomplish several things that they wouldn't otherwise be able to do. They were able to make the experience of going to the park so much more seamless. They were able to prevent things like whenever a family would show up, as soon as they got through the gate, one person, the fastest runner in the family, would collect all of the family's tickets and then run around to all the rides to set up as many fast pass reservations as they could. But by virtue of having technology like this, that didn't have to happen. So, so a bit of trivia here for you. I'm curious, does anyone know what color the Disney reader shows up when everything is good? Green. What color when everything is not good? Red. No, 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 no. It is blue. It is not red because there are no errors or problems at the happiest place on earth. The blue literally means you require assistance from a cast member. But it's not, it's not just fun and games like this. Here is Disney's Be Our Guest restaurant. And the interesting thing they do here is they encourage you to order your food in advance here, such that when you show up in the building, the magic band tells them you are in the building. So the kitchen will start preparing your order, such that when you sit down, the first thing that happens is not a waiter coming and introducing herself. The waiter comes over, the waitress comes over, looks at you, greets you by name, having not asked you your name, because the magic band told her, and serves you your food. Now, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's really, really kind of freaky to us adults, but it's important that when your kid asks, how did they do that? Every self-respecting adult is required to say, it's magic. <laughs> it's AI, that's another good way of putting it. <laughs> but what I'll, what I'll say about this is, if you've ever worked in a restaurant, you, if, if you can't increase prices, if you can't increase the size of the restaurant, you can't change your hours, the only way to make more money is to do what? Turn the tables. Exactly. And what they're doing is they're taking the waiting out of the front of the process such that you feel like you can stay there as long as you want instead of them having to rush you out after you're done. So the Magic Band and its related technologies have caused some significant improvements. So it turns out at the Magic Kingdom alone, they were able to increase peak park capacity by 5,000 people and they were able to reduce turnstile time by 30%. Now, I'm not a mathematician, but if it costs about $100 to get into the Magic Kingdom, you multiply that by 5,000 people, that's a half million dollars right there. And it's why the true magic of Disney is truly making your money go poof. <laughs> but, friends, does this meet our criteria of the win-win-win? Yes, I think so. By building the systems and the processes in place to allow you to be more ready for that moment when the customer needs you. So at this point, I want to close by making one more point, if my slides will join me there. If you notice something about the three R's, all three of these words begin with R-E. And I was a really, really poor student of Latin, but R-E literally means again and again. And so the way you connect with your customers isn't to just try to build a relationship with them once. You have to do it again and again. To be responsive, you can't be quick, on the spot, and you know, fast one time. You have to do it again and again. And to get ready for a marathon instead of a sprint, you have to do that again and again. And so my closing point for you is this, is to think about 
the projects that you're going to undertake in your, in your job or maybe some more in your, in your academic program and think about how can I deepen the relationship with my audience? How can I be more responsive to them? And how can my organization be more ready to meet their needs in those moments when they need them most? Thank you very much. So I'm told we have a little bit of time for questions. Or are we going straight to break? OK, great. Thank you. Thank you for volunteering to be first. And as a prize for you, see me after, and I have a copy of my book for you. <gasps> see, it pays to volunteer to go first. That's what happens when you take risks. So I was just telling her when you were talking about the systems and the processes, Disney can do it because they have a lot of money. But what about small businesses? Would you say that you can make, you can make better use of money, the same amount of money, if you have systems and processes in place from the beginning, even though it takes some time to figure those out? That, that's a good question. And it's a question I'm often asked. And that is, how does someone with a smaller budget really, really accomplish this? And my advice is to pick one project and start small. Because with an approach where you're, you're creating this better experience, ultimately that starts to pay off, which gives you more resources that you can reinvest into the process. So my advice would be to start, pick a small project where you're gathering data and doing a customized offer for a customer, and then implement that, measure the results, and then do the next one and then the next one. So that's the point of doing it again and again, is to continue, continually learn from it. But it doesn't mean you have to start big. You can start really small. Thank you for your presentation. And sorry, we were a little shy, but we might need the coffee. Um, in other words, I, I wanted to know, in the scenario where you had like the three people at Apple Store, and you happen to be that one person versus the rest of the culture, mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts about that, and how do you engage everybody else to say, hey, why don't we do this to help our customers? You know, in retrospect, I've, I've thought about this, and I realized that that day I was, the, they saw me as being unreasonable, and I saw them as being unreasonable. And, you know, the question often comes up, well, is the customer always right? And in some, in some cases, they are not, however, in their minds they are. And so the, th the thing that I would offer being in that situation is one, to always empathize with the person in front of you. And over time I've realized that they were doing exactly what they were supposed to be doing. So I don't hold any ill will towards them there. But I think the lesson is for us when we're on the other side of that, when we're part of the organization, we need to be thinking, Hey, what's this person going through? What's their perspective? And how can we respond in kind? Because in that moment, if they had said, you know what, it's not our, it's not our policy to, to, to work on something this quickly, but we're gonna make an exception for you today. It took a third person saying, no, wait, we can do something about this. And so, and I realize they can't do that all the time, but what I hope is that as individuals, we start to empathize. And I do believe that it's incumbent upon us as marketers, I'm gonna stand on the soapbox here for a moment, we have incredible tools like social media at our disposal, we know how to use them. The thing that marketers should not be doing, we should not seek to publicly embarrass a brand. We should not seek to be that kind of problem. We should try to take our complaints offline. As my friend Jay Bear would say, we should try to be an offstage hater instead of an onstage hater when we need to be. And the reason I offer that is because once it's on stage, there's a certain posturing that has to happen, right? But if you handle it more respectfully, more um, indirectly, I feel like your, your, your chances of getting the result you want are greater. So that's my soapbox. As marketers, don't disparage a brand on social media because of two reasons. One, it doesn't look good on you, and number two, you might need a job from that brand at some point in the future. Hello? Okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you, are you going? 
Um, so I want to ask a question, especially for uh, this new online e-commerce world and mm -hmm. the virtual assistants. Like we live in the dichotomy of uh, how much I really need to, you know, automate everything to solve a lot of the process throughout, and how much do I have to put the human touch? Mm -hmm. So in terms of the virtual assistants, um, you know, there's sometimes you're really bothered of those automating AI mm -hmm. responses. So what what can you do? to make them a little bit more human and use both part of the AI and part of your human touch to make it more you know, re relevant or... Right, I think what it comes back to, and it, it differs in every organization, in every industry, I think what it comes back to is this idea of understanding what the customer wants in that moment. Because when I was talking about my experience with Apple, I wanted a person, a person was the only thing I needed in that moment versus if I'm waiting in a long line to pay for a cup of coffee, the last thing I want in that moment is a person. I want a machine that will let me pay for my coffee and leave. And so I think the nuance there is to understand your individual customer, realizing that we all serve a different customer, and understand what their balance would be in that situation. For instance, there are some fields like banking where the personal touch, the human touch is more important. I think. You know, in e-commerce, we don't have that kind of expectation until there's a problem. And so, I'm not going to give a blanket sort of approach, but I think the key to the approach is understanding what your individual customer wants in that moment of the journey. Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. I wanted to ask, um, when you're implementing something new, normally you have that hesitation from the staff of mm -hmm. doing something completely new and, and just changing everything. What has worked for you in the past in order to get them on board with that change in the culture and, and however you're doing things as of now? That is a big, big, big question. Because no, nobody, I mean, there are entire classes that can be taught on that. There are entire books that can be written on that subject. My belief is always to empathize first and understand their perspective. So if you're pushing for a change, what, does, what is that person's perspective on it? Do they feel like their job is being threatened? Do they feel like they're being replaced by technology? Do they, do they feel like that their, um, their world that they control is no longer their world to control? And so by understanding their perspective, then you know well, here's how I can communicate this to them so that they understand. And I find that in most of those situations where you have a cultural battle to fight, it's, it's a battle not of change, but a battle of understanding. And I would encourage you to go in with a listening first approach. Understand what the concerns are, and then you have the data you need to then take action. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you.